and we've offered the assistance of the Broome County DA's office any way that we can to help him move forward with this investigation. I'm just going to touch on a couple things. We did do a press release yesterday uh, where I spoke a little bit about uh, the incident that occurred back in 2021. So I'm going to touch on that just briefly. Um, there was an incident in 2021. We've been in touch with the Susquehanna Valley School District regarding that. Uh, the defendant was participating in an online class at that time, and he made some disturbing comments uh, about murder and suicide. Uh, a teacher uh, responded to that, followed up with the defendant, trying to get clarification, and he indicated that he was just joking and said, LOL. This was all on a, on a message um, online class. Uh, the teacher reported it to the Susquehanna Valley School District authorities uh, based on the fact that the defendant was not on campus. He was not at the school at the time. The school resource officer was not involved in it. It was turned over to the state police because they went to the defendant's residence to interview him. Uh, once they interviewed him, he again indicated that this was a joke, uh, but the state police took precautions and took the defendant to Binghamton General Hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. Uh, at that point in time, he was evaluated by a healthcare, uh, mental health care professional, and a short time later, he was released. Now, based on HIPAA laws and other things, and th this just happened four days ago, we don't have the uh, details of that report. However, from past history, we know that if someone was found dangerous when they go in for a mental health evaluation, they're immediately uh, committed and actually transported to a state hospital for further evaluation. Uh, that did not happen in this case. The defendant, who was 17 years old at the time, was released to the custody of his parents and returned home. He was actually cleared and went back to school and participated in his high school graduation. Uh, there's a news report that uh, neighbors were interviewed that even indicated that he had a graduation party at his house. So at that point, he was, uh, was not a threat. The unfortunate thing is the New York State Police, school officials, and mental health professionals, now they don't have a crystal ball. They can't read into the future. They can only evaluate the subject on the information that they had at that time. And the investigation is focusing on what happened after that period of time to just about a year later uh, when this past Saturday in the uh, in the city of Buffalo. So again, that was a, a review of that indicated that the New York State Police followed up appropriately on what the school dr district advised them of. They properly transported the individual to Binghamton General Hospital for a mental health evaluation. At that point in time, he was found not to be dangerous at that time, and he was released to the custody of his family. Another issue that has been brought up, and I'll just touch upon it, is the uh, red flag law of New York State, where individuals can apply to the court for an, what's called an extreme risk protection order, or an ERPO ruling. Now, this application can be made by anyone. It's a civil procedure. It's not a criminal procedure. It can be brought by a family member, a school official, a counselor, the police, in the district attorney's office. Generally, it's brought by someone who indicates that they know the person, they're concerned about the person's well-being, and they've had contact um, with that. Because that person or that party that brings the action has to go forward and prove it in court. And just like any other law, we've heard a lot about bail reform. The red flag law is just like any other law. As a prosecutor and district attorney of the county, I'm bound to follow that law, whether I really agree with it or not. Um, for the court to issue this, proof has to be given to the court that the individual is dangerous at that point in time, that they're a risk of harm to themselves or to another person. Now, at that point in time, this defendant had been interviewed by a mental health professional, professional who deemed him to be not dangerous or not uh, at risk of harming himself or others at that particular time. So there would have been no basis for the hearing to go forward at that because you had a professional medical person who evaluated him and found him not to be a risk at that time. 
Again, if during that evaluation the defendant was found to be dangerous, he would have then been committed to a state facility for further evaluation and, uh, and treatment. Uh, there was no basis under the mental hygiene law to detain him at that point in time, and, uh, and he was released. Now, if the laws need to be changed, I'm sure that the, uh, the lawmakers in Albany will be looking closely at this case as a test case to see do laws need to be expanded, do they need to be changed, does there need to be different protocol. Every agency involved in this investigation uh, that I've talked to is obviously going to reevaluate the steps that were taken. However, again, you can't see into the future. Just like any defendant released on bail, there's no guarantee that they won't reoffend. Uh, this was a 17-year-old uh, student at the time who had no history of being treated for any mental illness that we know of. Uh, he was evaluated and released. And this incident happened a year later. So uh, again, unless someone is found to be dangerously mentally ill, you can't be detained just because of mental illness or a mental crisis. So uh, that's kind of the procedures that we went through. Uh, I will answer your questions now, but I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, but if any of it carries over into DA Flynn's investigation, I'm going to have to politely say I can't answer it. That's part of an ongoing investigation. So not that I won't be able to talk about it in the future, but today as we sit here four days into the investigation, uh, there's I'm limited as far as talking about what happened in, in Buffalo. Was your office notified about any of this last June, or are you only finding out about it now? Well, we're, our, our officers knew about it. The school officer knew about it. I mean but the DA's office. Was the DA's office made aware of? Yes, individuals in the DA's office did know of this, the incident. Knowing what turned out, knowing what happened in 2022, what do you wish happened in 2021 involving this suspect? Well, there's recommendations made. I mean, you, you can't change the law going back, but uh, obviously they probably recommended follow-up treatment, as they do in all cases when someone is evaluated for a, a mental health crisis. Uh, it appears that he obviously didn't follow up on any of that. Now, under New York State law, no one can be forced into treatment. No one can be forced to take medication. That's just the law in New York State, and we live in a free society. However, you know, if more services were available, for him to take advantage of. And I said, I'm not placing blame on any, on parents or on the school, but he obviously needs to be guided toward treatment and it doesn't appear that he, he received it. Mr. Korczak, did you personally have conversations with the school resource officer or school officials at Susquehanna Valley High School or with the state police investigators with regard to Mr. Gendron following the uh, comments that he made about 11 months, nearly a year ago. Our school resource officer program had contact with them. I personally did not speak with the Susquehanna Valley School District. Given what uh, happened and the fact that there was that mental health evaluation, should there be other steps when that kind of a violent threat is made to look into whether or not it is a violent threat independent of potential diagnosable mental illness? Well, we still, we're bound by the law to go forward. So in, in order to get that order where he's prohibited from possessing or purchasing firearms, we have to prove to the court that he is likely to harm himself or others. And we had a medical professional evaluate him and say that at that point in time, he wasn't likely to harm himself or others. So we're kind of bound by the law and we have to follow that law. I, I'm not permitted to bring frivolous cases to the court or try and you know, hope the judge follows this, even though the law says that he's already been evaluated and found to be not likely to cause harm to himself. So at the moment, there's no sort of extra investigatory steps that take place unless there's that mental health uh, asterisk, for less, lack of better phrasing, on that case? Right. If there is one of the, uh, the ERPO or the order from the court prohibiting him, then he goes into the registry that if a background check is done, when he goes to purchase a gun, it'll come up. Now that's up for debate. Uh, when someone goes for mental health treatment, should that automatically trigger them on the registry? I don't know, I'm not, I don't make the law, but then we're trying to encourage individuals to go seek mental health treatment, and if they know that they're gonna end up on a registry, every, if they go, you know, it, it might, people might be reluctant to follow through on the treatment that they need. Should anyone that puts in writing a murder-suicide threat be not allowed to buy a weapon? 
Well, according to the law, if they're found to be dangerous to themselves or others at the point in time they're evaluated. I mean, again, I was 17. I never did this, thankfully. People say stupid things all the time. And then you're, you're reaching into uh, trying to read people's minds and things of that nature. That's why I feel that the state police did what they had to do. They took him up to Binghamton General Hospital and got an evaluation. Is what happened on Saturday afternoon at the store in Buffalo the type of thing that occasionally keeps you awake at night for concern? Not, not that there necessarily is anything or was anything you could do, but still of concern that somebody who has been in contact with Broome County's justice system ultimately winds up offending in such an egregious way where in, in this particular case 10 people have died. It keeps me up at night every time someone posts bail and is out on a violent felony hoping they don't reoffend. it keeps you up at night. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in. People do have liberties and we have to abide by the law as it's written. Um, I'm sure that the... Uh, the lawmakers in Albany will be looking at this case closely. Did law enforcement know that he had access to firearms when he made those threats? The threat itself hadn't, didn't mention firearms at all. So, I mean, the state police went and interviewed him, and actually he denied that it was even serious, that it was a joke at that point in time. And they took that extra step, though, to make sure that he went and got evaluated. Did they speak with the parents at all? Do you know how involved I'm, I'm not. I'm not aware of that, but he was released from the hospital into the custody of his parents. Do you have the, the timeline, the date of the, the threat in writing, the, the time that the police responded and when he was I, I don't charged. have that. It was early June of 2021. He graduated at the end of June. Do you have a timetable between how quickly all the events were in relation to the other? Within a few days? Yeah, it was. With the, the police were notified immediately, and they responded uh, shortly thereafter from my reading of the reports. And did he go to the hospital overnight, or was that is that something that can be done in, in just a basically inpatient visit? My understanding is he was brought to the hospital, but depending on what time of day you're brought, he did stay overnight at the hospital, but then was released. Mr. Korchak, have you ever had occasion to speak with Peyton Gendron yourself or his parents? Oh, no, I've never spoken with... Uh, the defendant or his parents. And so, and you were uh, up until Saturday. You personally were un unfamiliar with the family. That, that's correct. Dave Korchak, just a few minutes ago, Attorney General uh, Letitia James said that her office will be launching an investigation into the social media platforms that uh, the Buffalo Shooter uh, used to plan, promote, and stream his terror attack. Do you agree with her decision to investigate these companies? Well, it's something to look into as to whether there's you know, violent threats, you know, just like in terrorism cases where individuals are radicalized online to join the Taliban. I mean, it's something that should be monitored, but, you know, you're walking a very fine line with uh, the First Amendment, you know, people's rights to say whatever they want. The First Amendment protects people from saying outrageous things. Um, you know, do I think they should be monitored? I, I do think so, because we have a lot of criminal defendants that we prosecute that are involved in this dark, online underworld and but that's the world we live in now and that's what we got to deal with when lawmakers look at this case in albany so what do you hope will come out of this what are the new laws and regulations i'm really hoping that uh that more treatment is available to those that need it but as i stated before you know, it's a free country, and even under New York state law, you can't force anyone to take medication, you can't force anyone to be treated for a mental illness, and unfortunately, it's not until a crime is committed, really, that the DA's office gets involved and someone is prosecuted, but um, obviously, any way, anything we can do to prevent what happened on Saturday, I would be uh, in favor of looking at. Could you be specific about more treatment? Should the, does the school not have enough treatment for its students specifically? Should police have a, a follow-up procedure that every few months they're checked in? What's your suggestion? Well, in this particular case, it was difficult because he did return to school. And now that school is back in session full-time in person, individuals within the school would have been able to monitor him and see how he was doing. But he graduated shortly after that, and then there was really no supervision uh, available to him. You know, as well as it should be, it is a free country. You don't have to check in with people. But based on the fact that uh, this happened, you would hope that someone, his family, a counselor, someone would have kept checking in with him to make sure he was okay. But then again, 
people hide things too. You know, you have functioning addicts in the workplace, and people don't know it. Um, there's a lot of underlying mental health issues out in our community um, that need to be addressed. How you do it is, you know, if I knew that, if I knew that answer, I probably wouldn't be standing here. The uh, suspected shooter withdrew the option for an evaluation for a mental health check now that he's been arrested since what happened on Saturday. Given that we don't actually have confirmation that what drew him to commit this act on Saturday was mental health, what other steps are you potentially looking at in, at ensuring that you can catch people before this happens if they don't necessarily qualify with a mental illness? Well, it's just very difficult. That's why you hope the community would get involved and actually you know, report people if they're acting strangely, have unnatural behavior, but, you know, part of the problem is nothing, you can't force anybody to do anything. And, again, we don't want to go into a situation where you're having forced incarceration and forced treatment, so it's really a, it's really a, a fine line you're treading between you want to protect the community, but you have to protect people's rights as well. In the state of New York, is there a way to make sure that someone who could be violent doesn't get their hands on a firearm if they don't have that history of mental illness? There's really no way of doing it, and there's actually no way of preventing someone from driving into Pennsylvania and purchasing a firearm or purchasing a firearm on the street. Um, again, the, the mental illness is more the, is more the focus. The firearm is obviously a concern, but... Um, there's a lot of people, we have mental health um, defendants who, they don't have a mental health defense because it doesn't rise to the level of that they're not mentally competent to stand trial, but they have a history of mental illness. We had just one guy recently who killed another individual by striking him in the head repeatedly with a hammer. You know, gun control wouldn't have helped that situation. It's the mental health aspect of it that needs to be addressed. Aside from providing assistance to the Erie County DA's office, is your office now actively involved in any other actions as a result of what happened in Buffalo on Saturday? Well, we're working with local investigators, you know, the local state police, just to assist the Erie County District Attorney's Office in their investigation. Um, everything is open at this. I can't get into the details of the investigation, but individuals are being interviewed that had contact with him over the past several years just to sort of find out the background information and, you know, not that you're ever going to solve what led up to this, but at least try and understand. Has, has anybody so far suggested that anyone in Broome County had prior knowledge to what the 18-year-old Conklin resident did on Saturday, that anybody around here knew what was likely to happen? I don't have any information on that personally, but everyone is going to be questioned that had any contact with this individual in the years leading up to this. Can I ask it in another way? Uh, should the residents of Conklin expect more law enforcement presence in the next few days? It being the crime scene is actually in Buffalo. I mean, the state police were at the residence of the defendant and did a search of that residence, and they were interviewing neighbors and canvassing the area. They'll most likely go to the school and, and question individuals there. Anyone, as I said, anyone who had contact with the defendant at any point in time is someone that we want to talk to. Do you foresee charges against the parent? Again, he's an adult. He was 18 at the time that this was done. The parent, my understanding is that the parents were cooperating, uh, but the investigation is still ongoing, and I can't really get involved in the uh, DA Flynn's investigation. Has your office contacted his parents or interviewed his parents up to this point? We personally have not, but the uh, state police investigators have been involved in that. The entire world is hearing about a white supremacist from Broome County. What would you say, how would you characterize the problem of white supremacy in Broome County? I don't know if racial bias is only, it's not limited to Broome County, it's limited to the entire world. And now that you can go online and access any type of website, uh, a hate crime is a hate crime no matter who it's against. And uh, my understanding is that the DA in Erie County will be presenting the case to the grand jury shortly, and obviously hate crime charges will be incorporated into that uh, for the grand jury to consider. But your, your, your job is to protect the people of Broome County. Do you see a problem of white supremacy in Broome County? We don't have a lot of uh, racial bias cases that come in, but 
you know, it's really it's really educating people and um, you know exposing them to to different uh, different people. I mean, it's it's really hard to say. I mean, the DA can prosecute the crimes that come in. You know, as far I would love to be able to say that I could change the entire community for the better, but I just have to do my part, enforce the laws of Broome County to make Broome County a safer place for people to live in. And when you read his writings to think they were authored in Broome County, what should be done about what people say and write in these somewhat public forums online? That's where you're, you're battling the First Amendment, because everyone has the right to be stupid. <laughs> Unfortunately, I hate to say it that way, but that's really what it comes down to. You can voice your opinion. There's never no consequences for your opinion, but you have a right to say it. And again, with the uh, the dark web or, or whatever you want to refer to it as, uh, it is a major problem that young individuals get sucked into this hole. And uh, with all the time they were spending at home during COVID, again, that's no excuse. This individual is 18 years old. You know, we can try and fix the system of mental health, we can try and fix bail. We can try and fix a lot of things. But the one person who's responsible for this is sitting in jail in Buffalo right now. Do you think other young men in Broome County, teenagers, may have become self-radicalized over the last couple of years and perhaps have some of the same apparent beliefs that Peyton Chandran seemed to have expressed in his writings? I mean, it's entirely possible that that's happening all over, but we, we really have no way of knowing that. I'm sorry, in the back. Uh, the Erie County Sheriff Garcia <coughs> said that uh, the shooter fell through the cracks. Based on what you know, do you feel the same way? Well, he did fall through the cracks, you know, as far as the system goes. Uh, however, when you look at the defendant individually, you had a 17-year-old high school student who had never been treated for mental illness before. Obviously, he was suffering from some sort of delusion or mental illness. When you look at the writings, you can, you can tell. Uh, however, if, if a person does not have a history of mental illness, how do you prepare for that? If you, if he had a long history of mental illness, you know, I know it's called the red flag law, but there would have been red, red flags to the school, to neighbors, to police. However, as far as we know, the information I have, he has no long history of mental illness like you see in some other individuals. Is that a requirement for, uh, is that something that triggers the red flag order? Like, must the person have a history of mental illness? No, they don't have to have a history of mental illness, but uh, the, what has to be proven to the judge is that they're an immediate threat to themselves, the safety of themselves or others. So the fact that he was evaluated and found not to be dangerous and not to be a threat to himself or others would sort of uh, show that there was no basis to, to get one of those orders. And do, does your office pursue those orders often? Do you have a sense of how often and, and what makes a successful uh, request? We, we, don't, we don't have, uh, we don't keep statistics on it, but you know, since the law has taken effect, we've probably done it over a dozen times. However, I would say 90% of the time it's related to a criminal charge. It's related, most cases we've dealt with, with domestic violence, where a domestic violence charge is brought forward and the individual who's charged has guns in the house. And then the state police know that, and they bring, they come to us, and we go forward to court, uh, which is a lot easier to prove when there's actually a criminal charge in place. Um, so those were the case, those are most of the cases that we, that we deal with. Is there one thing you wish happened differently? It's, it's hard to say, because anyone can look back and say, oh, he said this to me, or I saw this, and I should have done something, but, you know, in and of itself, one thing might not be an ind indication of it. Uh, you know, you just wish that uh, he had some friends or someone who would uh, be able to discourage him from this kind of conduct. But uh, again, if he's radicalized online, I don't know who he was talking to or following, but uh, you know, it's a very disturbing trend. And uh, you know, we're hoping that by looking at the system and how it works, maybe this is the last time we'll have something like this. Uh, Unfortunately, it probably won't be the last time throughout the country or the world, but we've got to do what we can in Bruton County to try and fix this mental health problem. So, so here we are, four days since the massacre in Buffalo. Do you, are you concerned that there may be copycat incidents like this? Because apparently, whether it's people here in New York State or elsewhere around the world, there are some people who uh, have this view or share some of the views of 
of the uh, suspected shooter, are you concerned that there may be similar instances by people trying to replicate what, uh, what happened in Buffalo? Right, that's always a concern. Just as when there's a uh, you know a drug or gang related shooting, you're always concerned about retaliation. When there's something like this, your major concern is that there could be a copycat. Now, uh, D.A. Flynn in, in Erie County had a press conference the other day, and he indicated that uh, there was already a copycat that called in a threat to a, uh, I guess, a store there and said, "I'm going to come and do the same thing to you that happened in the uh, Tops Market." Uh, that individual was tracked down by the Erie County uh, Police, and he was taken into custody and charged. Unfortunately, it was a telephone threat, and because of the new bail laws, he was immediately released. So, I mean, there's a lot of things in the system that need to be fixed. Um, sometimes it takes a tragedy such as this to get people moving in that direction, you know, so we can put partisan politics aside and uh, strive for the greater good of the whole community, because... Uh, it doesn't matter what party you are or, or what you believe in. This is just a horrific act that we hope will never happen again. Was there much communication or contact between local officials and the suspected shooter after the mental health evaluation was sort of concluded last year? No, I mean, that's one of the reasons why you use the term slip through the cracks. After that incident, we have no record in Broome County of any contact that he had with the police or anyone calling in a complaint. So from June of 2021 until last Saturday, it was, he was off the radar. There was nothing um, that anyone called in and filed a complaint. Did you think another student at a local high school were to make a very similar vague threat, called it a joke afterwards, would there be any different steps taken this time around? The way the law is written, everything would happen the same way. You would be A mental evaluation would take place, and if he were found to not be an imminent threat to himself or others, he'd be released into the custody of his parents because under the mental hygiene law, he could not be held for further observation if he was found not to be dangerous at that point in time. So the actual law would have to change for you to see a violent threat on its own isolated and continue to do follow-ups without the mental health aspect. Right. I mean, if there were more, if there were more, I guess, more things that happened after he made the threat, if he spoke to someone else, if he had some action, actually, but the fact that he just said it and then said it was a joke, you know, you got to go by what information you have at the time. And since the police didn't have any more information, who knows what was on his computer, but that doesn't give you the basis to go search at that point in time. Uh, just the fact that he made some, you know, terrible comment. That incident was serious enough that there's a record of it. Should gun sellers have access to similar records, even if a crime hadn't been committed? Well, that's for the lawmakers in Albany to figure out, based on the fact that until he got, unless he got on the registry, unless he was found to uh, be a risk, he would, they would not file the pr protection order and he would not be on the list. So, Should they? I mean, that's something, as I said before, you can argue both sides, you know, I'm a lawyer, that's why I argue both sides of it, but I mean, if, if your position is you want to encourage individuals to get mental health treatment, by saying, if you do, you're going on this list, you know, but and then where does it end? Do I'm not even asking about treatment. He, like he put a threat in writing that was investigated oh, right. by state police. Right. Mental health treatment or not, should a gun seller have access to information that that person has been investigated for a threat? You know, that's the First Amendment argument, really. I mean, do you have a right to say something inflammatory, and should they have an opportunity? You know, again, if you're, the law doesn't, prohibit individuals from saying thing, anything they want. That's the First Amendment. So, you know, I don't make the laws, I just follow them. So that's something for the lawmakers in Albany to uh, debate. Since we've been talking, the governor has signed an executive order to address domestic terrorism in New York State, and it sounds like she'll require counties to submit their own plans. I, I know this is probably the first you're hearing of this. What would you say on Broome County's behalf, what plan could happen here to address the domestic terrorism aspect of this? That's a very good question. I'll have to follow up with the with the governor on that. But I mean, what do you describe as domestic terrorism or mental illness? You know, it's it's really a matter of who you're dealing with and, and what they're doing. I mean, this is this didn't happen in our county, but it started in our county. But we had the uh, the Civic Association shooting, and that individual apparently had been reported to the police by his family 
that he was having mental health issues, but the law didn't allow him to be incarcerated for anything at that point in time. And look at what the end result was. So, you know, it's really a matter of the laws that come out of Albany to make a determination, balance people's liberty with protecting the community. It's, it, it's, it's a very difficult uh, decision and a, and a debate that's going to go on for a long time. Do you think that the mental health evaluations as they currently are conducted, which may have been perhaps as brief as, as a 15-minute evaluation of, of the shooter um, in Buffalo, do you think they're, uh, they're inadequate, that uh, perhaps more in-depth mental evaluations are appropriate so the, the professionals can make a better judgment about a person's uh, perhaps threat to himself or others? And I'm sure that will be looked at, uh, maybe the time period of how long someone is, you know, examined. But again, all this costs money and staff, and it's, it's an issue that has to be looked at. I'm hoping it will be now. Would I, you characterize this as domestic terrorism? Terrorism, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm from downstate. Terrorism is flying planes into buildings. This is just murder as far as I'm concerned. It is terrorism because you're terrorizing the community and it was racially motivated, we believe, at this point in time. But, you know, from the DA's perspective, crime is crime. And uh, whether you, whatever your motive for doing it, your motive is you're, e you're an evil person and that's why you're doing it. So, so, I mean, I really don't get into what's terrorism and what's not terrorism. It's crime. Well, would you, if, if, uh, if, if 9-11 is terrorism and this is crime, I guess I'm curious where you see that, the line at. Is it about motive? Is it about the number of people killed? Well, terrorism is, is, your, is your motive, why you're committing the crime. Now, if you're looking to, you know, I'm not a terrorism expert. You know, if I did, I'd be on CNN. But uh, it's, it's a matter of we handle it as crime because we have to prosecute the case. So that's why I'm conditioned to look at it that way. Um, you know, the terrorism is global and wide scale, but you can have domestic terrorism. We have that all the time. The snipers in Washington, D.C. was domestic terrorism because the community was terrorized at the time. They didn't know where it was coming from next. This was one individual committing her heinous acts, but at one point in time, and he's immediately in custody. So, uh, again, that's where the copycats come in. They create the domestic terrorism as well because the people think, is this not over? That type of thing. So you wouldn't necessarily characterize this as domestic terrorism? I'm just curious since the, the news... You know, I'm, I, I don't put labels on it on everything. It's an act of pure evil. I'll give you that, so... Um, I, I appreciate the, 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 your time taking our questions, but what, what was your goal in coming out here today? Well, I kind of wanted to set the record straight as far as, you know, the incident in 2021. Because when it first came out, there was information online that this defendant had threatened to shoot up the school. And the school clarified that as well. That never happened. There was no mention of a gun being used. You know, it just, again... It needed to come out that that clearly didn't happen, and the school clarified that. And also the standards of proof in the their red flag law, that we have to follow the standards of proof and follow the statute, as we do in every other case. And uh, again, uh, you can't hold a person under the mental hygiene law unless they're found to be dangerously mentally ill, and that hadn't been determined at that point. Now, again, at the time, the individuals who do the evaluation and, and the police, they deal with what they're dealing with at that point in time. So if someone could be stable one day, but then some incident happens in their life that sets them off, and then next thing you know, they're committing a horrific act, uh, and they're mentally ill. But it was not, you know, detected at the time. So, I mean, it's a very, I'm not a mental health expert. It's a very slippery slope, and uh, we have a lot of cases of individuals that are prosecuted for violent crimes that have a history of mental illness. Now, had they been incarcerated, they would not have committed the violent crime, but you can't be incarcerated just, not just because, but because you have a mental illness. Thank you. All right, I really appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mean to give you a hard time. No, 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 no. <laughs> All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks.